companies and companies. Their goal was to learn not just technical know-how, but also the creative mindset and iron discipline of the Japanese people. Today, I was told more than 400,000 Malaysians are employed by 1,500 Chinese companies and that are operating in Malaysia. Like all of you here, I look forward to hearing Ambassador Takahashi's views on the impact of the Look East policy. I am also eager to hear his insights on adapting the policy to fit the current global economic and political landscape. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time of extreme uncertainty. First day is the pandemic. Even as Malaysia and the world at large transition into the endemic phase, COVID-19 to lives and livelihoods. There's a war raging in Europe's heartland whose fallout is affecting the entire world. In our region, tensions are growing between China and the United States. Supply chains have been disrupted and inflation is soaring. The rise in the cost of living threatens to dip millions of people into poverty and misery. The threat of famine is indeed very real. The widening levels of income inequality threaten to reverse progress. And the rapid advance of technology is also changing and disrupting every aspect of life. And above all, looms climate change, which poses a threat to the very survival of humanity. Our planet, our home is burning up. Literally. Clearly, implementing the sustainability agenda is no longer just an option, but an urgent imperative. Ladies and gentlemen, Sunway has fully embraced the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, which were adopted by the United Nations in 2015. This year, we are taking our commitment one step further by pledging to achieve net zero carbon emissions across our businesses by 2050. <clears throat> and Sunway is the first corporation in Malaysia and among the first in Southeast Asia to introduce a carbon pricing framework in, into our businesses. Our business divisions will work towards their own decarbonization targets. Our business division that fail to meet this target and the amount deducted from their bonus pool. In this context, I am proud that Sunway University hosts several international entities to, hunt, to advance the sustainability agenda <clears throat> in these regions. This includes this institution includes the Jeffrey, Shell, Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development and the Asia headquarters of the UN's United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or UNSDSN. And Sunway University also houses the head office of the SDG Academy, which is the education arm of the UNSDSN. The SDG Academy plays a fundamental role in Mission 4.7, which was launched by Pope Francis in December 2020. Mission 4.7 is a global initiative encouraging governments worldwide to include a sustainability curriculum from kindergarten to high school levels. This year, we have taken the first step towards this mission by integrating an SDG module into each student's learning experience here at our Sunway institutions. The module is designed jointly by the SDG Academy, the Jeffrey Sachs Center, Jeffrey Sachs Center and Sunway University. Our last latest initiative here in the Sunway in 
is the Sunway Center for Planetary Health. It is one of a few such entities in the world. We are convinced that the health of the planet and its people is interconnected and interdependent. The new center will work closely with our existing institution at Sunway University to advance the sustainable sustainability agenda in a holistic manner. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to share that our efforts have earned us several accolades. For instance, the UK's Times Higher Education Sustainability Impact Ranking placed Sunway University as the top private university in Malaysia. And we are now ranked among the top 200 universities globally for our contribution to several of the SDGs. Our five-star QS rank, uh, rating continues to affirm the quality and employability of Sunway University graduates. Indeed, Sunway University has been voted number one in graduate employability among all universities according to the latest Talent Bank Index. I am also proud to share that Sunway University is ranked among the top 1% of university in Asia. It is pertinent to note here the impact of the Look East policy on, on Sunway as well in the sustainability sector. Let me share a few examples. Sunway University, the Sarawak the uh, Sunway University, the Sarawak Forest Corporation, and the State's University of Te are working with Japan's leading technology companies, Aeroscience Incorporated and Funlit Corporation. This collaboration aims to improve the mangrove forest in Sarawak through the adoption of drone technology and artificial intelligence. And Sunway University is also currently partnering Toy8, an edutech startup from Japan that is backed by artificial intelligence. The joint research project focuses on addressing social educational issues in Southeast Asia. Sunway Group also holds a long-standing relationship with Hitachi. We established a joint venture company, Sun, Hitachi Sunway Information System, in the 20 uh, in the in 2000 to provide it services and solutions in malaysia and southeast asia and separately we also collaborated with hitachi in 2015 to conduct a joint study on energy saving technology and energy management in sunway city here we also have a long-standing relationship with the Furukawa, Furukawa company and Hokesu company in the trading and manufacturing sectors. It is very established more such collaborations with world-class Japanese university and innovative companies. And I firmly believe that in order to be the best, we must work with the best. Sunway's commitment to the sustainability agenda is driven by our conviction that realizing the SDG is not the responsibility of governments alone. Building a sustainable future requires the commitment of all elements of society, the private sector, academia, civil society, and of course, every single one of us. We are all in this together, ladies and gentlemen. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Tan Siri Jafichia, for your thoughtful observations about the present turbulent times. We have just lived through two years of physical lockdown, and we now face a war in Ukraine accelerating inflation around the world, increasing political polarization within many uh, societies, and more frequent and more violent weather events globally. We are looking for answers 
and we are extremely fortunate to have Ambassador Takahashi Katsuhiko speaking to us today about the continued relevance of the Look East policy for today's problems. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1987, who is my intellectual sister, because her thesis was also supervised by the Jeffrey Cha Distinguished Professor at Sun City, Jeffrey Sachs, by join, joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs together upon graduation from the law faculty of the University of Tokyo. in different parts of the world. The Republic of Iraq, the Nilotic Republic, also known as Republic of Southern South Sudan, United Nations headquarters in New York, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And best is not only deeply knowledgeable about Middle Eastern and African societies, is equally at home with Latin American and Caribbean issues. He is also the go-to person at the foreign ministry about Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ambassador Takahashi was appointed the Japanese plenipotentiary to Malaysia in October, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, Unway's contribution to deepening international and domestic harmony through better understanding of each other's culture and each other's religion. The focus by Sunway on international, which is SDG number 17, reflects the total devotion of the top Sunway leadership of Tan Siri Jeffrey Cha and Vice Chancellor Sebrantis Popema to the entrenchment of the 17 SDGs in the daily activity of the Sunway family. My fellow lucky Malaysians, let us put our hands together and welcome His Excellency Ambassador Takahashi Katsuhiko. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, Tansuri Jeffrey Chair, Foundation Chancellor of Sunway University, Datsuri Richard Rayat Jan, Special Envoy of the Prime Minister to East Asia, Professor Elizabeth Lee Fu Yen, Chief Officer of the Sunway Education Group, Professor Shibrandes Popema, President of Sunway University, Professor Datuk Wu Win Fi, Vice President of UN Sustainable Development Solution Network and the Research Professor, Sanwei University. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I really feel honored uh, to give an opportunity to deliver a lecture in Sanwei University. As Tan Sri uh, explained, that the Sunway Group has a lot of collaboration and organizations such as Hitachi, you have mentioned, and Jetro. And uh, I was educated to know a lot more companies are working together uh, with Sunway Group. Also, I was just told before coming to this room that the Sunway Union and 200 Japanese students. Also, there are 10 partner universities in Japan, so uh, I really 
very much appreciate Sanwei University's strong linkage uh, with Japanese uh, educational institutions. Uh, also, I think um, this is Sanwei University, the center of SDGs in Malaysia. And when I was in New York 2012 to 2014, I was involved in the discussion on how to create uh, sustainable development goals. At that time, our mind setting was just a post millennium development goal, but pushed by the voices from the developing countries, we agreed to create the new goal called the Sustainable Development Goal. And we negotiated quite toughly to narrow down the number of targets. I, I left uh, New York uh, before narrowing down the option to 17, uh, but I'm happy that uh, SDG come with 17 goals, and now uh, it is paid attention to uh, by the people in the international community. Today, uh, I'm given the uh, title uh, talking about LDP, LEP, request policy, under the title of LEP in present turbulent times. Uh, and I think delivering the lecture in such a uh, university which have a very strong tie with Japan itself is really meaningful for me. So I really feel honored uh, for this opportunity. Uh, outline uh, of my lecture is already on display and I'm going to proceed uh, with this sequence. Let, let me uh, see start it. Uh, we keep on saying, look with the policy is a Malaysian policy. It was started by the Malaysian government uh, 40 years ago. And uh, Tansuri has mentioned about uh, the understanding of Malaysians on look with the policy. But we usually say in our understanding, uh, it was 1982 and the venue was Majeka Jamaica joined the conference held in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Majeka is a Malaysia-Japan Economic Association, and it has a counterpart uh, association in Japan called Jamaica, and they have annual meeting, and uh, in this joint annual conference, Prime Minister Mahathir came to the meeting and spoke in front of us. At that time, uh, Prime Minister Mahathir said that the, and I quote, I have been exhorting Malaysians to emulate the Japanese particularly in work, work ethics and ethical values. And we have come to realize that the basis of your rapid development is your sense of commitment, with willing, willingness to work. Afterwards, uh, the Malaysian Prime Minister's office described the crystal policy as follows. Uh, it was written in Murray, but uh, according to the English translation, and I quote, this policy means the government of Malaysia will make study, research, and the selection of the best examples and role models from Japan and Korea by adapting it to the conditions in Malaysia. I have a, I have a feeling that what Dr. Mahathir was aiming at originally when he talked about LEP seems to be bigger uh, than the but whatever uh, the definition needs, Japan decided to help and facilitate Malaysia to implement request the policy positively since then. And we really feel honored that this request the policy continue up until now. Um, in the past 40 years, a lot of achievement was made uh, through the request policy, but usually I start with numbers. Malaysian students and the government official who studied in Japan under this request policy program is more than 26,000. This number itself, itself can be a very huge number. A Japanese side also make an effort in response uh, to the eagerness uh, from Malaysian side. For example, Japan 
helped prepare curriculum for Malaysian students before going to Japan. This includes not only Japanese language training, but mathematics, physics, and those other things which will be necessary for the students to learn. So we dispatch Japanese teachers to Ampan Ashan Japan in Malaysia, in Malaya University. And this type of assistance continues for more than 40 years now. Japan, not only send, uh, sending teachers, we also help to open vocational institute in Malaysia. For example, Center for Instructor and Advanced Skill Training called the SHIAST in Shah Alam, which was opened in the 1980s by the Japanese assistants, and the JMTI, Japan Malaysia Technical Institute in Penang, was opened in the 1990s. The most recently, university level institutes like Malaysian Japan International Institute of Technology, MJIIT, was opened in Kuala Lumpur 2010. So there are a variety of assistances starting from the preparatory stage of the sending students to the implementing the education of Japan uh, into Malaysian people inside Malaysia. I, I think this that series of those policies has created a positive cycle of human resource development and investment. As a result of this, I can say the number of Japanese companies operating in Malaysia has increased. Tansuri mentioned 1,500, but the latest figure of Japanese companies now 1,601. <laughs> so those companies uh, operating all over Malaysia. And this number uh, is bigger than neighboring ASEAN countries in comparison with population or economic size. So this factor itself regarded as a remarkable achievement in my view. Of course, evaluation of blue crystal policy should be on the Malaysian side because it's a Malaysian policy. But Japan hopes that it helped Malaysians to develop its economy to the current level. Now I move on to uh, item number three, typical comment against LEP. Uh, since I came to Malaysia November last year, I talked about LEP, request the policy in uh, media interviews, seminars, and various other occasions. I, I think some of them have a chance to uh, listen what I talk or read what I wrote. Of course, as a Japanese government official, we still push Malaysian side to continue the policy as this is real for the bilateral relation between Japan and Malaysia. Of course, I hear a lot of supportive reactions on the crystal policy, but it is also true that there are some comments against or casting doubt on the crystal policy. Therefore, it may be fair before I talk about next steps of the crystal policy, to introduce two types of major comment I encountered and put forward my views toward them. Comment number one uh, is Malaysia no more needs to learn from other countries. Or in other way, if I put it, the crystal policy as a policy to learn something from outside is not relevant any longer. Actually, these people tend to see the crystal policy uh, was wrong from the, uh, tend to say in this way when I sit together with them. And these comments are based on the understanding that the crystal policy started with some domestic and political background at that time, when the relation between Malaysia and the United Kingdom was deteriorating. As a reaction, Malaysia rather inclined to look east instead of look west. This says such politically motivated policy is wrong and does not necessarily meet with economic needs. Politically motivated, this may be true. However, uh, the core significance of the look east policy 
is economic and social development through the human resource development. Resource development was quite strong at that time and remain relevant today. 40 years ago, Malaysia needed to promote the transformation of its industrial structure so that Malaysia can create on its, its own industry in addition to traditional ones like palm oil, petroleum, and so on to strengthen its economy. And Prime Minister Mahathir took a key for it in Japanese culture and ethics. It was 1979 when Mr. Ezra Vogel wrote a book titled Japan as Number One, and many countries paid attention to economic development of Japan at that time. But Malaysia is probably the only country to implement a policy like the Lukwist policy at such a large scale for such a long period of time. Another thing I want to mention here is that Malaysia has now developed and it is quite natural if people start to think Malaysia can go on its own way. If you have a look at the statistics, Malaysia's GDP per capita now already exceeds Japan's GDP per capita 40 years ago when Lukwist policy was initiated. And the life, expectan life expectancy of Malaysia now is more than Japanese life expectancy 40 years ago. Therefore, we can say Malaysia already reached the level of Japan when request the policy was started. Having said this, is it okay to say that Malaysia has grown up economically and socially and no need to learn from experiences of others? I do not think so. Human resource development is still need, needed in Malaysia from relatively lower skill manual labor to continue to need imported parts for engine from Japan. Of course, the ratio of Japan made and Malaysia made, now Malaysia made is increasing, but still uh, we need to assemble the parts coming not only from Malaysia, but also from Japan. All, technolo all technological components cannot be produced by Malaysia by itself and need to continue collaborating with foreign countries. And thanks to the policy of Malaysia with Japan, now we already have existing system to utilize. There is a need and there are systems. Malaysia needs to learn more and we are ready to help it. The second comment I... from other countries, but not Japan, or Japan is no longer a model for Malaysia. It is true uh, that the 40 years ago, Japan was showing more energetic growth than today. Many had changed in the past 40 years. So that might make some people think Malaysia do not have to run from Japan any longer. I also hear that Malaysia should learn Korea and China. But by the way, as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, when I explained a request policy in the prime minister's office version of explanation, Korea has already been included in the scope of request policy uh, from the beginning. And I understand next year, Malaysia and Korea are going to celebrate 40th anniversary of request policy like Japan and Malaysia are doing this year. So I just want to mention Korea has already been included from the beginning. China, how about China? Of course, after achieving rapid economic development, 
China can offer lots of experience and lessons that Malaysia can learn. I am not going to oppose such views. But what I that the accumulation of experiences between the two countries already created a good base for continuing the program. For example, 10 years ago, Japan and Malaysia agreed to start the Look East Policy version 2, 2.0, putting special emphasis on high technology and high-end service industries. This type of discussion was relatively easy as we already had a common foundation. Also, need for working ethics and ethical values that Dr. Mahathir tried to learn from Japan still exist and attracting lots of attention uh, from the world. I had a chance to see Dr. Mahathir when he visited Japan May this year in Tokyo. And his original intention still remain valid. Even though Malaysia has developed economically and socially, we believe that the request policy is still valid as a channel to cooperate in accordance with Malaysia's evolving needs. Japan continues to be ready to help Malaysia as long as we are needed. So I just covered two comments against the crystal policy, and still we are confident that many Malaysian friends believe that the crystal policy should continue. Japan is also ready to help Malaysia as long as needed. But on the other hand, after hearing all those comments after my arrival to Malaysia, I strongly feel that we should not take for granted an existing friendly relations between the two countries based upon Lukist policy, and rather we need to do more effort to enhance Lukist policy to a further stage. This was exactly an essence of the conversation between Prime Minister Ismaili Sabri and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe when he came to Kuala Lumpur in March this year. I sit together in this meeting and I will remember that uh, almost two hours, both leaders, how to enhance this request policy. Also, Prime Minister Ismail Sabri's visit to Japan in May was an important milestone for request policy. At the summit meeting, the two leaders concurred with the further development of the crystal policy, taking into consideration the demands of the times. Dr. Sri Richard Riot was among the witnesses of this conversation together with me in Tokyo. So we have people who know how we are going to conduct our request policy in this hall. So I go to the fourth item, Look East and go beyond. I mean the look east policy from now. So two governments confirm that we will continue the look east policy. So I'm now in the position to promote look east policy. And the following, what I'm going to say from now uh, is our idea how to move forward uh, from now on. Yeah, I put the title, Look East and Go Beyond. Beyond what? I'm, gonna, I'm going to elaborate. Under this title, modifying scope and modifying relationship. Both modifications have two approaches each. First, modifying scope. And uh, one, there are two approaches. Uh, the first approach is expanding scope of manufacturing. As everybody aware here, Lucristo policy focused on manufacturing from the outset, 
and we can continue this focus, but with some modification with the advancement of technology. This is similar with what happened on Look East Policy version 2, which I have just mentioned almost 10 years ago. And putting new elements is one of the main topic between the two prime ministers meeting in May. Two prime ministers discussed elements such as digital, cyber security, 5G, and renewable energy. We also concluded a memorandum of understanding on av aviation industry and agreed to discuss further economic issues of mutual concern, such as creating resilient supply chains. This type of traditional cooperation will continue and it will continue to be a major part of request policy, no doubt. Another approach is in introducing other elements other than manufacturing. Now, request policy uh, is conducted uh, by Now, uh, is a little bit uh, outside of the portfolio of MITI or issues which may need interministerial coordinations. Therefore, this may go beyond uh, the existing bureaucratic system of Malaysia, but uh, I hope those issues to be duly taken care of. One thing uh, comes to my mind is disaster or DRR. Malaysia is famous for not experiencing serious natural disasters. That's what I was told. And this element really attracted lots of Japanese. In I came to Malaysia in November, at the end of November, and it coincided with a very severe flood in Kuala Lumpur and the state of Surango. So I was very much surprised. <laughs> Actually, I was watching uh, the golf club in front of my house and the water started to rise quite uh, rapidly. And uh, I, I, I saw, at, um, I never expected this to happen. So this is really one of the very vivid first impression of Malaysia for me. Now, of course, not only me, but all of you may have to, uh, pay attention to disaster risk reduction. And I think this issue shed light all over Malaysia. And I think flood will be the major issue which Malaysia have to tackle as a natural disaster. You may not have to worry much about earthquake, but the flooding is really the issue. And I think as with the climate change, it will become more severe and severe for sure. Japan uh, is a mountainous country. Uh, its population concentrated on low flat area alongside rivers. And on top of that, Japan is also subject to typhoons. So the water control is actually an important theme that Japan has been working on for centuries actually 100, 200, 300 years, we have been doing this. Japan also suffered from earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. Therefore, Japan allocated a lot of resources and developed technology to overcome disaster-related difficulties. This is main reason why Japan, ha Japan has been keen to host United Nations Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in the past, and we have been leading discussions among international community on disaster risk reduction. Of course, hardware is important, but the software is also what we care. For example, in Japan, 
lots of residents. Clearly marked evacuation sites in the event of the disaster. And even CCTV that allows residents to check river conditions. People go to the river to see the situation and then he go into the water and never come back. This type of tragedy happened, but we try not to make it happen again. So th those efforts enabled residents to evacuate quickly in the event of the disaster. Furthermore, it has raised awareness of disaster prevention and a lot of people start to implement evacuation drills. So I think this need will become more important in Malaysia. Uh, to Malaysia, now discussion going on with Japan on how to upgrade the smart tunnels. You have a few smart tunnels, but I think smart tunnels and reservoirs will be needed as a hardware. How to construct sabo structure in mountainous area. Sabo is Japanese words, but this is a dam, small scale dam, which was put in a small river, which can prevent the landslide to happen. Also, we are discussing how to provide more accurate weather forecast and warning to the people. I think density of radar uh, is one of the issue. So this may need some time, but I understand Malaysian side also try to upgrade accuracy of the weather forecast. So those are the area already ongoing, and I think it have a big, huge potential to be a new element of the Twister policy. Another example, uh, is preparation for aging society. Aging may be a relatively new issue for Malaysia, but we started to see lots of related articles in various media. By 2044, according to the World Bank forecast, the 14% of the Malaysia's population will be over 65. This means Malaysia will go into so-called super-aged society. Japan's population reached to that level around 1994. So 50 years afterwards, Malaysia will be like Japan in 1994. I checked the other statistic, population statistics, and I find out it's 50 years time lag uh, between the aging of Japan and aging in Malaysia. Therefore, in order for Malaysia to be ready for future aging society, it will be useful to draw lessons from Japan. Aging is a multifaceted issue and includes security system, healthcare, care houses management, are maybe the topics which we can easily imagine. But now it also includes discussion on how to provide life with dignity to the old age. As Japan has experienced challenges much earlier than other countries, Japan has created our own system. New measures continue to be introduced as society ages day by day. Some of them went okay, and some of them did not. Therefore, I can say Japan is in a position to show Malaysia what we succeeded and what we failed, which will help Malaysia to be prepared for the future, for next generations. In this context, I just want to mention one small step. Uh, for the first time, the Japanese Overseas Cooperation Volunteer, volunteer dispatched by Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, one lady who is coming from Japanese care house is now working as an advisor to care house in state of Serango. So now we start to see what the difference on the ground uh, between the care houses in Japan and the Malaysia 
And this will be duly reflected in the advices we are going to give to Malaysia in the future. So those are the two approaches of modifying scopes. And I want to talk about two approaches about modifying relationship. The first approach is to make the request policy two ways. Traditional request policy used to pay attention to dispatch Malaysian students, government staff, and businessmen to run in Japan, mainly manufacturing sector. Since traditional request policy has been one way from Japan to Malaysia, we may be able to say, in other words, donor and recipient. However, we should look at the policy under the new setting. Just before COVID-19, just before COVID-19 started in 2019, Japanese tourists visiting Malaysia was 400,000 annually, while Malaysians visiting Japan was 500,000, almost equal. Also, number of Malaysian students and the Japanese students in Malaysia was almost balanced with 3,000 students each. Now, without being noticed so much, our relation, in particular people-to-people -people relation, has already become more balanced than we tend to believe. I also want to mention that as more Japanese comes to Malaysia than before, now is a good time for us to learn from Malaysia. One thing I am recommending to my Japanese friends is diversity and tolerance. This is a value of Malaysia that Malaysia has been proud of for a long time, and Japan should learn from Malaysia how to create diversity and tolerance with the progress of globalization. I observed very intensive discussion on Bon Odori Festival in Malaysia recently. <laughs> but we really felt Malaysian people's power in support of diversity after we successfully carried out to Bon Odori Festival in Serangor and Penang. We are really thankful for this. On the economic side, know-how on Islamic banking and halal certificate are what we need to learn from Malaysia. Malaysia created a standard for them ahead of other Muslim countries, and we are benefiting from Malaysia's experiences when we do business with other Islamic countries. The second approach is to enhance partnership. As Malaysia is located, between the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, it has a great potential to be a various field of cooperation. Among others, education and human resource developments are prospective. As I mentioned to you, we already have an educational institute called MJIIT, and the University of Tsukuba Malaysia branch is what we are discussing with the Malaysian government to, establish, to be established somewhere in Malaysia in the near future. Those educational institutions, of course, can provide services to the Malaysian people, but also it can work as an educational hub uh, to the broader uh, uh, students all over Southeast Asia. Already in Shiast, uh, which I have mentioned as a Techno, uh, as a vocational training center in Shah Alam, that started as a training institute for instructor and advanced skill training for Malaysians 40 years ago, but they now receive trainees from Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam. So uh, it's now expanding. This is a good example of human resource development under the request policy can be expanded beyond the bilateral framework, like ASEAN and Indo-Pacific region. The benefit of human resource development can be brought to other unstable parts of the world, 
such as Afghanistan, Palestine, and others, through triangular type of cooperation led by aid agencies of Japan and Malaysia. It's a bit difficult to bring all those people to Japan directly, but maybe if we can offer some expertise, bring them uh, to Malaysia, that may be create more friendly setting for them and uh, good uh, technical transfer, uh, both from Japan and Malaysia. So those are the uh, two approaches I want to emphasize uh, in this look east and go beyond. Then now I go down to the last item. What do we do in this turbulent time? When you think of strong bilateral relationship of some two countries, it is sometimes based on just trade or financial aid. But in contrast, the Japan-Malaysia relationship is based on people-to-people -people connection and friendship through the request policy. We often come across anti-globalization sentiment. And uh, I, I don't know how many media people are here today, but uh, some media people rather try to uh, agitate me in responding uh, growing anti-globalization sentiment, but that is not what uh, uh, I favor to do. Rather, we talk about uniting, connecting, and collaborating with others, rather than dividing and disconnecting. In this backdrop, the importance of Japan-Malaysia relations should be especially emphasized in today's world because both countries have been prospering, which is characterized by freedom of navigation, free trade, and so on. That is one reason why we think concept of free and open in the Pacific, we call it FOIP, is becoming more important. The core value of this uh, concept includes what I have just mentioned, rule of law, free trade, and safety of navigation. These values are common between Japan and ASEAN countries also, including Malaysia. Japan really see FOIP should be maintaining centrality of ASEAN in line with ASEAN outlook for Indo-Pacific, AOIP, similar concept with the FOIP made by ASEAN countries. The efforts made by so-called Quad is also noteworthy. Although Japan, United States, Australia, and India do not always implement project under Quad umbrella together, but Quad countries are implementing project individually or collectively in areas such as COVID-19, cybersecurity, and climate change so that the region can strengthen foundation to keep free and open in the Pacific. Another attempt to bring back globalization is through various economic agreements and the framework. In this context, we welcome Malaysia's participation to RCEP and waiting for the Malaysia's ratification of CPTPP. Participation of both Japan and Malaysia to IPEF in the Pacific Economic Framework also enhance further collaboration between Japan and Malaysia on trade and investment. Challenges caused by Russian invasion into Ukraine is what we need to tackle. This is a rather uh, pressing issue. Food security and energy security is top of economic agenda. We appreciate very much for Malaysia's commitment to contribute to be a stable supplier of energy to Japan. 
and we need to continue conducting discussion on food security. But on the other hand, we need to sacrifice globalization for a while because of the invasion. Rule of law is now facing a serious challenge. If we accept invasion of sovereign state into another sovereign state without any justifiable reason, it will open a way for chaos, which will have negative impact on all sovereign states and it have a very critical impact on free trade. We need to work together so that this invasion will not be invasion will not be successful and sovereignty of each nation to be respected. As I discussed the Japan-Malaysia relationship with the basis of the Lucas policy is about uniting, connecting and collaborating by enhancing the request policy, the common values shared by the two countries can be exported to other parts of the world, contributing to overcome anti-globalization as well as inclination towards division and disconnection. As an ambassador of Japan to Malaysia, I will continue to do my best to enhance the Japan-Malaysia relationship with the Lucas policy as a steady foundation. I also call on you all here to today to host or participate in Japan-related events to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Lucas policy. By doing so, you can contribute to highlighting the importance of Lucas policy in the turbulent world today. I only spend eight months here in Malaysia, but I really appreciate uh, the kindness and the friendliness of Malaysian people. And I think this is mainly because of the Lucas policy, that's what I believe. Uh, and uh, we really need to do more. Uh, that's the reason why I'm standing here and the talk about the future of Lucas policy. I'm really looking forward to continue our discussion, how we'll be able to do better for the prosperity of not only Japan and Malaysia, but also uh, other friends all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. It was an excellent speech, full of very constructive suggestions of the way forward. For our questions and answer, I would like to invite onto stage Yang Prahamad, Tato Siri, Richard Riot, who is the special envoy of the Prime Minister to East Asia. And he's also the uh, member of parliament for Syrian constituency in Sarawak. So, Tato uh, Siri, I saw you taking a lot of notes. So I think I should start with you and say, tell us what's your reaction to the speech by His Excellency. And thank you for coming here at such short notice. For a start, I think I must apologize for coming late. I should have been earlier. Uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador, after hearing not only excellent, but super excellent presentation by you. I think what attracted me most after hearing your speech was just to aid. There was an article which can, came out yesterday and that was an assurance given by Jetro 
whereby Japanese companies, whereby Japanese companies who are already operating in Malaysia will ensure that at least actually this is already an assurance by Jetro that 43% of them will expand their operation in Malaysia. And to me, this is indeed a great news. As you mentioned, I was honored to be in the Prime Minister's delegation in his official, the current Prime Minister's visit to Tokyo, and that was in May. And Excellency Ambassador was there. And among the things which were discussed has already been mentioned by Excellency, His Excellency Ambassador. Now, the other thing which I would like to say here is, ooh, Malaysia has learned a lot from Japan. And I'm very impressed by his representation when he said that we must move from here, move more. Japan, even though he said well, it, is, it should be a Malaysian policy, it should be called a Malaysian policy, but to me, it's a Japanese policy. No doubt it was mooted by our then tribe, but without the cooperation, without what Japan has contributed to us, I don't think the look is policy has been as successful as it is. So I think I'll just end here first. Thank you. Well, we have uh, 300 people watching this online. I'll be collect, uh, uh, giving questions as they come on, been tra transmit to me on WhatsApp. Well, the floor is open. Let me invite questions. Yes, uh, Tansiri Gaf Jasman, former Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya and former member of the Sunway Board of Directors. Okay, thank Us. you. Uh, you mentioned about turbulence and you commented on the problem with the Russian invasion, but you have not commented on the possible conflict in Taiwan. You know? How will this affect, because this is closer to home. So I want to hear that, and it's also very close to your country, you know. Yeah. And secondly, assuming China becomes stronger and stronger, how will this affect the look is policy? Will Malaysia still be looking at Japan or more and more to China in future? I'd like to hear your views on this. Thank you. Thank you. Should, would, should, uh, do you want to take a number of questions and then answer them? It's the idea. Question. <laughs> oh, okay. Is this a something? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, you can do your own way. Yes. No problem. Yes. Okay. Well, let's pick another question. Sorry. Yes. Please. Um. Hi. Good afternoon, His Excellency NYB. My name is Emily from Environmental Defense Fund, um, an environmental NGO from the US. Um, I'm actually excited to hear Your Excellency, um, you talk about climate change um, and disaster risk reduction, I think is extremely important. Um, and I really recommend um, the Asia Energy Transition Initiative by Japan to support USD 10 billion to the ASEAN countries to transit uh, and decarbonize so my question to you, um, Your Excellency, could you elaborate more about the collaborations on climate change between Japan and Malaysia? And what else on this note that you think both nations should work together um, urgently? And secondly, on disaster risk reduction, um, you know, um, disaster risk reduction and also climate adaptation projects are typically viewed as a zero or negative return. Um, project to many of the investors and donors. So when you mention 
DRR is something that Malaysia could learn from Japan, what sort of case do you think Malaysia can build, um, you know, to in order to, for Japan to support this kind of projects and initiatives? Yeah, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Well, we've got two very different questions. <laughs> yes. So let's watch the super diplomat at work. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for two completely different uh, questions. But the, let me start uh, with the uh, uh, first one. Um, yes, uh, when I prepared uh, this uh, lecture, um, Taiwan crisis is not uh, uh, in front of us. So rather, I put more focus on the Ukrainian crisis. But the, uh, at, at least what uh, uh, we have to say is uh, uh, what, what is the uh, uh, value we have to follow and the rule of law comes first uh, and uh, it has to be accompanied with free trade and safety navigation. Uh, this is really important uh, for maritime nations to survive. Of course, Malaysia also surrounded by the sea, so I, I see the maritime nation. And uh, of course, Taiwan, uh, we cannot call it nation, but also the economic situation is quite uh, similar. Therefore, um, I, I, I think challenge is the same, how we can uh, uh, enhance the importance uh, of rule of law, law and safety of navigation for overall economic situation uh, worldwide. Uh, when the Ukrainian crisis had happened, of course, Russia tried to create a narrative that, that we are not doing anything wrong for the disruption of international trade. But actually, this type of conflict really created the disruption of trade, which really suffer the developing country who are depending upon uh, the exports coming from Russia and Ukraine. I think the same thing will happen uh, in uh, Taiwan and China if something happened. Therefore, we rather need to keep on pressuring uh, to all the parties that the, what is the value uh, we need to support and unilateral action uh, to uh, put risk on this type of system is really counterproductive, not only to the country being threatened, but the side also threatening. So that's the reason why now uh, what we're going to do with Russia is very important. If they start to feel that they are getting rewards from what they are doing, it will no longer intimidate the other party to do the same. So, of course, war already started. It's really a pity. But at least we have to demonstrate our strength. of approach would be needed and what is happening in South China Sea. Therefore, we really encourage other parties to speak out. When your territories were threatened, don't say it only bilaterally, but multilaterally. Make people know that you are concerned. Approach is very important. Speak openly what is the core value which we need to respect is what we really needed more. And this is also applicable to the situation surrounding uh, and the mainland China. Uh, I, I, I think we shouldn't overreact for what is happening uh, in the region. But I think un United Voice and show our uh, uh, unity uh, to those who are making, creating instability is very important at this moment. That's what I think I can say at this moment. And I move on to the uh, second question. Uh, yes, I think climate change uh, is one of the major issues. And uh, as I have a variety of issues I need to take up in my first presentation, so I skipped the climate change. But definitely climate change is one of the most important things 
with Japan and Malaysia, I should work together. And Malaysia, factory that exports petroleum and gas, uh, your target of carbon neutral by 2050 is really an uh, ambitious agenda. But without doing that, we won't be able to achieve our goal. So we are ready uh, to help. But at the same time, to help Asian country in Asian way, not going straightly direct to the target, but rather paying attention uh, to the each country's situation and prepare a tailor-made approach to achieve carbon neutral. And I think Japan will have some know-how to achieve this. So we are in close communication uh, with Malaysian side through the private sector or public sector, how we will be able to help. So we want to bring in Asian approach to this climate change issue. And I think disaster risk reduction also have a strong linkage of climate change. So we will deepen this type of discussion uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Wu, and uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for your very comprehensive and systematic presentation. Since you have uh, two approaches in many key sections of your thought, and I thought that I should uh, have two questions. First question is on uh, Luke East policy, and uh, I think in a number of occasions, including private conversation, uh, you emphasize that uh, it is time for uh, Luke East policy to broaden, to cover, defense and security uh, cooperation. And I think uh, the basis of the 2018 uh, defense uh, MOU between Malaysia and uh, Japan, um, the asset transfer and also security personnel exchange are the key uh, uh, activities uh, under the MOU. So my question is, uh, do you think that it's time uh, for the two countries? And maybe a question that uh, YB Dato Sri can also uh, answer uh, later on. Uh, do you think that it is time that for Malaysia and Japan to uh, further expand defense cooperation by going into security consultation in the form of a two plus two uh, that uh, clearly Japan has already started with our neighboring countries, uh, Indonesia three years ago, uh, and also Philippines this year? So that's my first question. Second question uh, is about manufacturing. Uh, I think that's the first point that you mentioned early on uh, when you talk about modifying scope. Um, so by manufacturing, uh, do you actually, uh, you didn't mention that, but I wonder if uh, that is something that you have in mind when you talk about manufacturing, you have also semiconductor uh, sector in mind, giving the, uh, considering that uh, Japan, US, Taiwan, and South Korea are talking about Chip 4 Alliance. Do you think one day a Chip 4 Alliance might become a Chip 4 plus X, including certain countries in Southeast Asia? including Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I want to ask questions related to SDG 10, reduce inequality. <clears throat> Malaysia is facing uh, a rising tide of suicides. In Japan, we know that country, uh, other than UK, of having a ministry on loneliness, partly to do with uh, the most vulnerable uh, segment of society. Do you think there's something we can learn? Could you tell us more about uh, the ministry on loneliness? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Concerning uh, the first question, uh, of course, we have an intention uh, to expand uh, the security cooperation uh, with uh, Malaysia because Malaysia is located in a very strategically important uh, location. 
uh, in the global trade and so on. So it's quite natural that we pay attention to. Uh, we already have a dialogue on the defense ministry's level. But if we expand it to two by two, uh, we, we have a lot of experience uh, to do two by two with other countries. So Japanese foreign ministry and defense ministry is, is closely cooperating with each other to have this type of dialogue. I, I'm not so sure if Malaysia have this type of similar framework with like two plus two, uh, but um, we are ready if Malaysian side is ready. That's what I can say at this moment. But with or without this framework, and now the communication between the relevant ministry, I mean the foreign ministry and defense ministry is in good shape. So uh, at least we already have a good channel of communication, but uh, uh, how we can convert it into, it's still uh, the topic remains uh, to be seen. Uh, concerning uh, the semiconductor and the axis of uh, suppliers or something, uh, Japanese companies are investing a lot uh, for this type of semiconductor businesses here. And a lot of companies are expanding their factories, one in Sarawak or one in Penan. I'm aware of those activities. Um, when we talk about resilient supply chain, or reliable supply chain, I may say, uh, the nature is supply chain shouldn't be stopped for political reason. If they can stop it intentionally for some political reason, we cannot call it reliable uh, nor stable. So as, as long as those industries remain as a core for the industry, I think uh, at least what we should aim at is to open uh, those resources uh, to everybody, regardless to the position. So eventually, this may be used as a weapons or a tool uh, to uh, tool to how can I say discriminate one from the other. But uh, this is what I don't want to see. Rather, we try to see it as a basic. Uh, industry and it should be open and this is a nature and becoming open is a benefit both to Malaysia and Japan so that's the reason why I said in my presentation Japan and Malaysia's approach is the same and I think I really we need to emphasize uh, this aspect concerning the uh, suicide issue I, I'm not sure if we have that ministry in Japan. Uh, of course, suicide is uh, uh, one of the phenomena uh, which Japan has been uh, tackling. Ages also uh, becoming uh, so obvious. So we need to uh, tackle these issues. And I think uh, when we talk about the next phase of the crystal policy, of course, all those social issues uh, can be included. I think aging society also come along a phenomena uh, which you are going to face uh, in the coming decades. So I, I, I think we'll be able to share our experiences and uh, you can pick up what went what is good for Malaysia and what is not. I think this is the approach we may be able to explore. I, I just want to add on something which I think some of us may not know. And that is one of the many good things that we have learned from Japan on the look is policy, i.e. the employment insurance scheme, which was enacted only in 2017 during the pandemic, early stage. Let us not forget 
nearly 6,000 SMEs would have wandered up. Would have wandered up. Golong Tika. But because of the Employment Insurance Scheme enacted in 2017, which was module, thank you very much, which was module on Japan and Korea, we saved thousands of people from losing their jobs, from the SMEs being winded up. So this is one of the things which I think we really owe to Japan under this look is policy. Now, I just want to say a bit because also many perhaps might not know what is the difference between a prime minister special envoy. Special envoy, anything to do with diplomatic relations with any other country is it's under the purview of the ambassadors or for Commonwealth countries and the High Commissioners. Special Envoy, like my post now, Special Envoy to East Asia covering th three countries, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, is more to do with investment. It's more to do, I repeat, more to do with investment. So I think, uh, because the hot topic of today will be uh, visit to Malaysia. I wouldn't want to mention the name. You all know it. After that, went to Taiwan. She was here. And I have been asked by many reporters, what is your comment? I said, I have no comment because I'm the Prime Minister's special envoy more on investment. So just in case any one of you might want to bring it up. So we'll leave it up. I will not respond to any question raised on the issue of her visit to Malaysia. As I said, no name mentioned a few weeks back. So with that, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are st I still see quite a number of questions from the audience, but uh, because we have another event that will be starting immediately after this, I have to very reluctantly uh, call an end to this, to this uh, proceeding. I, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speakers Series Public Lecture on the topic, the Jeffrey Chia Biomedical Center and the Cambridge Rapid Response to the SARS COVID-2 pandemic by Professor Ken Smith from the University of Cambridge at 5.30 in this hall. Everyone is invited to stay back and enjoy the lecture. We will have a short comfort break now and please do come back in five minutes for the Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speaker Series Lecture. Thank you. And thank you very much to His Excellency and Tata Sir. I'm very sorry that I...